welcome everyone here today. It happens to be Halloween for much more of a treat than a trip. We are going to be talking in this Gems from the Wisdom Traditions conversation circle about a remarkable person in history who truly was able to rise above thine and mine. He at one point owned more land than anyone in the world has ever owned and he never used one acre of it for himself. Uh, so this is the Bhutan land gifting movement in India that we're going to be talking about from the Gandhian tradition. And to do that, we have Sarah Hodges. And as I mentioned last week, she's a brave soul who in the spirit of lifelong learning uh, accepted my uh, suggestion that she might want to study this subject, which she hadn't heard about before. And she really is an appropriate person to take this up. She has done work with different organizations that have worked with people who are impoverished, people in need, people um, who are homeless and so on um, over a number of years. And she also has a little personal practice that I'm not sure she's ever told anybody about before I kind of pressed her. She, uh, she keeps a hundred dollar bill in her wallet. And it's this, just for when she meets somebody that according to her heart intuition, um, makes her feel as if they could really use this hundred dollar bill much more than she could. And, uh, and then she replaces it. So the, it's very much along the lines of today's topic on the uh, Bhutan land gifting movement. So Sarah Hodges, please. Hello. Thank you all for being here. And thank you, Renee, for kind of prompting me to learn about Vinoba. It's been so much fun to read and just hear about his practice and his philosophies. So I'll kind of start just for a little timeline. He was born in 1895 and born in India to a Brahmin family. So they were not low in the caste system. They had what they needed. He had very pious family members. His mother was one of his biggest examples. She would do her daily prayers. They lived in a very devotional household. And that was a big part of what formed the beginnings of what later became his Budan movement, the land gift movement. And he went through schooling at one point. He actually found schooling to be a place, I think he would tell his friends, it's a place for your most obedient slaves. That's where, or your most obedient followers, that's where you really go to just learn obedience. And so he was seeking something deeper. He was really on a spiritual path from an early age. And so he left school. He kind of did the minimal amount, proved that he was very able, but totally uninterested. He left school and he was drawn to go to either the Himalayas or to the Ganges, to past the Ganges, to another part of India, to Bengal. And he ended up in the Ganges for a time in the crossing to one of these places. And he there got wind of um, Gandhi. And it was there, Gandhi was at one of the universities giving a talk on his um, nonviolence and seeking the kind of wellness of the impoverished as well as the independence of India. And there he read uh, some kind of writing of Gandhi's and he actually had a lot of questions. He had a lot of things that he wanted to talk to Gandhi about. And he was able to write to him. He wrote him a few letters and they started having this back and forth correspondence. And it was then that Gandhi saw that there's somebody here that is really curious about what's happening and nonviolence and his teachings. And so he invited him to come out to the ashram. 
And Vinoba had said that he had come across many people that said that they were enlightened and they were in a state of freedom. And here he met Gandhi, who a lot of people regarded very, very highly. But Gandhi claimed none of that. He was, he claimed to be full of imperfections. But he was so drawn to, instead of going to the sadhus, the nomadic people, the spiritual people to learn with them, he was drawn to Gandhi. So he actually followed the invitation and he went to the ashram and he spent most of his early, his younger years there forming. And he kind of considered the time with Gandhi to be what chiseled him. He was this rough rock that came and Gandhi's teachings and the practices at the ashram chiseled him into what he then could continue on as. And the Budan movement came along a little bit later. He had um, spent a lot of time in the ashrams, gone various other ways. And then in around 19, 1951, there was a lot of tensions in South India amongst the, uh, the poor peasants and the poor village folk or whatever they would call them and the landowners. And there were actually, there was rioting. And so uh, Vinoba got wind of this and he wanted to go, he decided he would go. He left, he walked on foot to get there and he spoke to the landowners. So this was one of the first times that he really just was seeking any way that he could bring a resolution in a peaceful way. And he actually was able to speak to the heart of one of the landowners and really reach him. And the landowner came to him and offered him. The group of villagers were asking for something like 80 acres of land. And this landowner said, here's a hundred. And Vinoba was so shocked that this was even possible, that this was a solution. He, he saw that there's some solution here. And the village folk actually said, no, we'll only take the 80 something that we needed. We don't need to have extra and we'll serve this land. So serve it as we're serving God. And so there became this really beautiful to hear that this exchange that there was no need for extra and they were doing this out of with a lot of respect it seemed and this was part of Vinoba's influence that he lived with such respect and with such piety in his life that he was able to influence others in that way and it was not perfect and something interesting from a western perspective is that there's this idea that we should follow through and we should know the results and it should go well, and if it doesn't, then I did a bad job. And he had, Vinoba had no issue with this. He rarely stayed somewhere more than a couple days, and he would go on and walk to the next area and seek to more landlords. But he just trusted, and he trusted that if things were done out of goodwill, what needed to result would result. And it wasn't even about the results of people having land and living peacefully if that was not meant to be but there was really a sense of non-attachment and wanting to reach hearts. And that seemed to be at the core of his mission. What was happening outwardly was one thing, but truly reaching people's hearts was, was the real mission. So his message as he walked, and I think this is a message we can, especially in Hawaii, relate to knowing the culture of the land in Hawaii in ancient times of this non-possession, this idea of as one individual, I do not possess land over anyone else. And, and this was seen in a lot of Native American cultures as well. But Vinoba would walk with this idea that land be belongs to God. And if it belongs to, it's either all or none. There's no individual ownership. And he saw it the same way as air, the same way as the food we have. And he believed that nobody is a have not, that all of us have as being beings of spirit, beings of God, we all have 
very much. And it's our job to give. And all of us in here would say, if you, have, if you are poor, give. If you are rich, give. If everyone just give. And this, this is just a beautiful philosophy that we never run out with this idea. He also practiced living as the poor did. So even though he would have these great leaders come to visit him in his huts as he was traveling, he himself would not go to temples, would not go to ashrams, would not go to places, more temples and um, political housing and that sort of thing, if it wasn't a place where the poorest person was allowed. So he was really speaking to the caste system there that if, if one person wasn't allowed, then it wasn't a place where he wanted to be. To really show, he also spoke on that if he loved, he could not love one person more than another, that there was this really, this strong sense of unity in how to move through the world and how to see each other. And he spoke on a lot on the nonviolence of this, that to beseech someone or to try to fight for the land or for somebody's rights, the rights of the, the poor, that this would actually be an act of violence, even though it wasn't physical violence. Through that nonviolence, he felt that he would talk about reaching the hearts of people. And it was only through nonviolence, and this is probably a teaching of Gandhi as well, that through this nonviolence, the heart was able to be spoken to. And then real change could actually happen. In his very later years, he finally took a vow to stop traveling because he had been a traveler for most of his life. And he stayed in one place, something like what we would call a detention camp, but just what I think there's a Sanskrit word for just staying put in one place where people could come and visit him, but he would not go anywhere. He relinquished um, work in the social field and the political field, just allowing and also showing his, um, his unattachment to the result of this. He didn't have to fight for seeing his ideas or his visions to some end. It was his life work. And when he knew it was time to be still and be in contemplation, he did that. And at the age of 87, he became unwell and he knew that his death was approaching and he had doctors and friends and everybody was trying to convince him to get medical help to revive him. But he had a sense that it was his time. And so he actually renounced all food, all drink, all water, and he fasted. And he fasted for eight days and then left in complete peace, it was said. Just having seemingly just a beautiful closure to walking through the world and having his actions be for the total for entire society rather than for his own good. So it was, it's been inspiring to read about him and to hear how a life can be and something to aspire to in a small sense that maybe the amount that I care for my health, that I care for my sleeping, isn't just for my own good, that I feel good, that I'm not grumpy and all these things, but for a larger ripple effect. And maybe that's a, a consideration or some idea that I can um, extend to everyone, that what are these actions and these small, maybe at least seemingly small actions that we do, but that really, really are in the heart and bring a ripple effect to the whole in that we are all together. There isn't, what we consider in the individual is not actually what things are perhaps. I open the floor up for any comments, any ideas, questions. Thank you so much, Sarah. It was a beautiful presentation for us. And it, um, your last comment 
on top of everything that you said about Vinoba Bafe um, himself, makes me feel as if he even held his life um, in trust instead of saying, this is my life. Mm -hmm. but even his presence here on earth, he just held lightly. Um, he, it sounds as if he stayed here um, so that he could be a benefit. And then when he could no longer be a benefit, he just let that life go. Was it something like that? Mm -hmm. that's, that's the sense I got too as I read this, that it, there wasn't this individualistic sense of, even though their individual was there, it seemed like he was aware that there's a personality there and he's being perceived in this way at different times, but his life was for the service. Even the cultivation of his spiritual life was for the service of what he saw as the greater collective. Thank you so much. That was a really special talk. I really appreciated it. And what struck me was um, you said through nonviolence, we reach the heart and real change could happen. And I think it is, and, and that he wasn't attached to the outcome. And to realize that even the small actions we take, we may not know the ripple effect or what effect it has, but if we can live that instead of fear and anger, but we can really live through the heart and that does have a ripple effect because we all are one. And especially in our country right now, I think that's a really important message. So I really wanna thank you for that. Thank you for saying that. There was one part in the reading that I, I really took note of, and this reminds me of that. And he was asking to God, he was at some point that do I keep, am I able to do this and keep doing this so that we have enough land for all the poor? Because he was doing the math in his head and seeing how much land was being given, huge amounts. And he was, he had one night or something in this writing and he said that he just asked God, can I, can we do this? Am I going to get the yes from you? We can do this. And God said, if you fear about if you can do this or not, it will become violent somehow. Trust and just keep asking. And it was like this steady determination, this slow, steady. Great. Trust and just keep asking. I love that. Thank you, Sarah. That was uh, just a lovely talk. Uh, however, more than uh, your talk about Babe, I was actually more struck with the Renee story about you, about the $100. <laughs> I, thought that, I thought that was really special. And... Um, you know, during this pandemic, when we're trying to support the various small businesses, restaurants, et cetera. And, you know, I, I, I've read that they said to, to give, you know, to tip the, the restaurant workers, they, I've read give till it hurts or, you know, those kinds of things. I mean, when I do takeout now, I, I never really used to tip, but you know, I do try to, you know, give more than, than I need to, but the hundred dollar thing kind of really, wow, that, that just sort of shifted everything for me. You know, I thought that was really a, um, kind of a, ni a nice, um, gosh, a nice thing to sort of have ready. And so I thank you for that. That that's, uh, I think a lesson that we can all you know, in, in trying to be better people. Um, I think that's a, a lovely idea. So thank you for that. I think sometimes it's these ways that we can give, it's an opportunity to have our hearts open in a way and show whoever might be there in whatever moment that I love you, that I care for you, that I see you. And it might be a little gesture, it might be a big gesture, but I, I know reflecting in the moments that I, I feel the gesture towards me, I, no matter what it is, I feel all of a sudden a life that there are people around me that care. And that actually, that means so much, even more than maybe having another dollar in my pocket. But the fact that there's this community that shows up that cares in whatever means that it's shown it can it can change the world i think 
even one individual at a time. Sarah, um, just thinking along those lines a little bit, of not just about us giving, but he was able to get so many people to give. And the thing about Vinoba, I've done a little bit of reading about him is he was, he's very much in the shadows of Gandhi. You know, he, his whole adult life was kind of in the shadow of Gandhi. And yet Gandhi considered him his very first shot, satyagrahi. So he was the first one to go to prison on behalf of the satyagraha movement. And he spent a lot of his time in prison. Um, I was thinking the idea of satyagraha is to take nonviolence into a context of violence. But it seems like um, Vinoba was able to take the idea of giving into a context of, of selfishness and somehow dissolve that selfishness. Um, and I was wondering, because to me, Vinoba is like the most humble human being possible. There's that wonderful line of Gandhi's that, where he says that to swim on the bosom of the ocean of truth, you must reduce yourself to zero. And it seems like that was Bonoba's goal was to try and reduce himself to zero. He would often be the person that would spend a good part of his day cleaning latrines and doing, doing tasks that the untouchables would do. So he would be able to fully identify with the untouchables. So I'm wondering if this humility, he seems to be an exemplar of humility. If that's a way of um, encouraging empathy. So when he would go to one of these villages and he'd meet the wealthy people, he would tell them, consider me one of your sons and give me that land so that I can give it to them. And somehow it always, almost always worked. And so I'm just wondering what you might think of the relationship between humility and and triggering empathy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, you can imagine anyone today walking around saying something like that, consider me part of your family and give me land. That would not be taken well. Nobody would offer up this land, but somehow I don't think he was hardly, he was hardly ever turned down. And there was something that he said on that note that if he approached someone, he said, even any landowner, anybody, even with the biggest ego, everyone has their faults, but see God in them. He would see God in them. And he would, he said that if he wasn't able to reach their hearts, if he got stuck on some exterior at some wall, the ego being the wall, then that was on him. That was his ego that got in the way of that. And so I, I would think that it would be also his practice of really chiseling away at his own ego that made it possible for him to find that little, even the tiniest little hole to get in to that heart and speak right into the heart of the landowner. And also doing it in a, in a way to bring up the landowner and not bring them down and say, oh, horrible you for being selfish and all these things, but let me touch your heart and show how much more there is. And, or somehow, I don't know, but that was the sense that I got that it was his work that in himself and the years that he spent seeking. And if he wasn't able to get through and kind of be in that world of, um, of greed or possession and not see through to, to God in that and touch the heart, then it was on him. I remember him saying that about himself, that if, he, if, if someone wasn't giving, he would put it back on himself, that he, it was somehow, he, there was a blockage in himself to being able to connect with that person, something like that. Yeah, which shows even more the humility that it's oh. on him. <laughs> it's not the ego of the landowner. <laughs> Seems as though he really had, in terms of humility, he had something to be humble about. I imagine that coming from a Brahmin family, being well brought up, I'm sure he was well spoken. He was obviously extremely intelligent. Um, 
I just imagine him just carrying himself so well so that all those became assets in this, um, in this service that he was striving to give to the poorest of the poor. Mm -hmm. That when they heard him speak, they knew he, I, I believe the caste system in India is such that they would recognize that he had been born to quote unquote, one of the higher castes, just his way of speaking and his demeanor. And yet he was appearing in a loincloth, <laughs> maybe with sandals, maybe barefoot <laughs> and asking nothing for himself, only asking um, for the poorest of the poor. And one, once again, this idea of using anything that he had in his life uh, <laughs> as a means of service. Yeah. It seemed that he he was very much inspired to do that by Gandhi and and also his upbringing. So his in his writings or in the book of him, it was he was talking about his grandfather who they had an uncle who lived in their house when he was a young age, and they left to travel. This uncle died. And they, had, they didn't hear of it the normal way that usually when a family member would die, the mother would know right away. It was days later they heard about him and Vinoba asked his mother, why, are, why have you not told me about the death of this uncle? And then they explained to him that this was not an actual blood uncle. This was someone who had I think lived on the streets but just didn't have a means and he was blind. And, um, and so they housed him and they fed him and treated him just like an uncle. And so he had these examples from very, very young. His mother as well was extremely generous and would take care of the community before that she would take care of themselves sometimes. And so I think Gandhi furthered what was already really in him from very young. And he speaks to that, how lucky he was to have such an upbringing where there was really this spirit of giving and generosity. He did say that when he came to the ashram, to Gandhi's ashram, he was like a brute, a kind of a rough, really rough character. And that Gandhi kind of whipped him into shape, but he didn't know how to talk to people. Gandhi would send him while he was working, send people to see him because Gandhi would tell his visitors, you need to go to see Vinoba before you leave. And Vinoba wouldn't even acknowledge them or talk to them. And then Gandhi would tell him later, come on, you have to talk to people. <laughs> you have to be a little engaging here. <laughs> and so he really, he had to learn that. And that was part of his work. <laughs> and in a, in a way it's neat, it shows us that we're not, we don't always have all the tools and it takes time and we can continue to chisel away all the time. <laughs> and use whatever tools are around. Can you think of anyone uh, that exemplifies some of these same traits that we're hearing about from Vinoba? I imagine this is open to everybody. It's open to everybody. Is it, and it doesn't have to be somebody that we can read about in a history book or on a, on a newspaper. But maybe you've had someone like that in your life. Uh, I'd love to um, share something about my husband. Um, so some, some of you know Ben. Um, ben and his brother inherited a, an old family farm in Wisconsin. And um, his ancestor was like the first white settler in this county. And so had this like kind of choice piece of land there. <laughs> And of course, like now we know that there were so many bad treaties that went into this whole thing. But anyway, this farm has been in their family for all these years and has ended up with Ben and his brother. And one thing that they've decided to do with this farm is to put it into a trust so that it can become this sort of uh, like a historical community space. Um, so like now they have, um, they have a lot of artifacts uh, from 
from the, the original settler. And so like a lot of material um, has been very useful. Uh, like in Wisconsin in the fourth grade, students learn about Wisconsin history. So they have students in the fourth grade go to visit this farm so that they can actually see like a butter churn and these like really old uh, pieces of equipment. Um, but I really admire Ben and his brother for doing this. And I think a lot of it has to do with their upbringing. You know, like their mother really instilled in them that they were custodians of this property. Like it didn't, like it sort of, it went down to them but it, it doesn't really belong to them. And so they had this responsibility to do something with it that would benefit everyone. And so they're going through this, there's like a small woods and they're going through the process of putting in some paths so that it can become like a little park for the community to use eventually. But it's like a really long-term plan that they've been working on for years. And probably it's going to take the rest of their lives to figure out and they'll have to pass it on to like a nonprofit, they're sort of in the process of creating a nonprofit to manage this property. But I really admire them. I feel like they're doing it in kind of a similar spirit, you know, that this land doesn't belong to just Ben's family. It's really there for the benefit of everyone. And thank you, Sarah, so much. That was really a lovely talk and very inspiring. That's very, that story is very much in line with one of Gandhi's main principles of trusteeship, that we need to transition away from the idea of ownership to the idea of in trusteeship, that whatever we have, we have it, we're, we're given the responsibility of using it for the good of the whole, the idea of Gandhi's idea of Sarvodia. So your, your husband is very much in line with Gandhi and trusteeship there. Robert, your face just appeared. Did you have a comment you'd like to make? Yeah. I don't know if I have a good enough internet connection, but Sarah reminds me of the women um, that are part of the commune where um, I think uh, Vinova died, but um, Rama Vidya Mandir uh, Ashram. And uh, the women there are so devoted to uh, Vinoba. And their devotion is such that they maintain a, uh, a focus and intensity that uh, is uh, overwhelming to uh, a Westerner <laughs> because they are so focused uh, on what they do. And, but the relevance here is, is they're continuing his experiment uh, with this commune of making a idea of self-sustainability. They do a lot of ecological experiments there, uh, like you know, generating your own energy and sustainable farming practices. And they try to be exemplars uh, in the use of land and resources for the whole of the rest of India. And <clears throat> they, um, one of the things they're doing is they're uh, raising the original strain of cows of India, which uh, most of the cows got mixed up with uh, Western cows. But the pure strain of Indian cows is a bit smaller and thinner. And uh, uh, they're affectionate in some ways, like one of our participants here, Maurice Bashev, is his wife got a kiss from one of those cows. <laughs> if you ever get a chance, I think you would very enjoy it. You can actually sign up and uh, spend a couple of weeks there if you notify them. Um, and they're right next to a river and it, it's just one of the, uh, it gives you a feeling of Vinoba that uh, I think you would appreciate. <laughs> That's really wonderful to know that something like that exists. Thank you for sharing that. And these examples, I feel, can be really small examples when we think about what Sarah said about Vinoba, considering that the divine is in everyone, 
And so no one is a has not. We all have something. So the rich should give and then the middle should give and the poor should give. Everybody should give. And, um, and we have all kinds of examples um, like the widow's might, I think, uh, of the, the most valuable gift being from the very poorest because they have so little and yet they still share. So I'm sure we all know people like this. <laughs> Mary does. Well, I'd like to speak about Mary's daughter, Malia, who teaches hula at Still and Moving Center. Uh, we had a, some kind of hula get together potluck at Ala Moana Beach Park one, one evening. And I'll never forget because um, these home, this ho uh, homeless family approached us, asked for food, you know, and we obviously had more than enough. And I was j just, um, her kindness and her generosity really struck me, you know, because these people, and, and it was just so funny because she was making them a plate and I guess she missed the, the chicken, some chip fried chicken thing. And they were like, oh, you know, um, can you <laughs> include the fried chicken? <laughs> Which she did. And then, you know, sent them on their way. But, um, you know, I, I was, I'll never forget that. Because I'm not sure if, if I were in her place, I would have at that point in time been as generous, you know, they, they were just obviously very bedraggled, not smelling so great. And, you know, they're approaching us. I was a little bit of a, you know, oh my God, who are these people? But it didn't matter to her. She just, you know, welcomed them and, and gave them their food and, and sent them off. So, so thank you, Mary. I know she, I know she got it from you. <laughs> <laughs> there's an organization here on the island called street angels <clears throat> that has uh for years now been a, a group of volunteers people volunteer food and they put together meals they were um i think it was tuesday evenings right at five o'clock when i would start teaching at still in moving center um they would they would come in very stealth like because this is totally not not Pono with the actual laws, but everybody looked the other way. And they set up these long tables and people uh, would line up and they do a meal service in about a half an hour to an hour. And then everybody would disappear. The tables would fold up and they'd be gone. And uh, no, nobody got paid a cent. Yeah, they're called street angels and uh, really beautiful organization. I think the woman who was running it, her name was Joy. Just go figure. <laughs> The, the tie with uh, last week's topic, uh, when we spoke of um, Pema Chodron, is her idea that compassion takes place between equals. And so, Sarah, you brought out so beautifully, it's a matter of touching hearts. It's not the exchange of stuff. In fact, we could give something stuff, some, someone stuff, we could give them money, we could give them food. And yet if we made them feel in any way less than ourselves, it wouldn't be a true gift. We would actually be, be demeaning them. Whereas for example, the way that you described Malia as greeting this family and serving them as if they were part of her own family or halal or friendship group um, gave them exactly the same respect and accord is a meeting of equals. And that is, I think, sometimes the, the greatest gift. And I think that's what you were implying in, uh, in your talk, Sarah. Um, I think 
uh, Vinoba also really uh, and exemplified this. Um, uh, when I went to Panchampali, which is the village where the first gift was given, um, it's kind of debatable whose idea it really was because Mr. Reddy was the landowner. And they were concerned about and I think Vinoba was concerned about the fact that India could have drifted into a civil war because communists were, who tend to use more violent means, were around. And you had all these landless people. And of course, he had a lot of compassion. Um, but it's interesting to use Renee's example there. It's unclear whose idea it really was. Uh, as I traveled around and in the village, I kind of heard both stories that it was Mr. Reddy's idea as well as was the Nova, because the Nova was viewed as kind of a spiritual saint in the Indian tradition. Um, and he, he was so open and, and so felt so equal in a way to all these people and saw the divine in all these people, that it's almost like he would evoke whatever they needed, whether he said it or they said it, in a way it didn't matter because they're not separate, really. He just evoked this because it comes from the heart. Um, so it was, um, it was really interesting to hear the, that story that it's very possible you know, Mr. Reddy, the landowner, was so moved by uh, the Nova's presence and then by all the people that were that needed the land. And um, this gives real hope that even people that are kind of rich and closed off trying to defend their richness, so to speak, or they get smug, um, that if you can touch the heart, people can give. So, um, but like Renee pointed out, I think you have to, it, it's on a level basis. And um, so I just felt that was really interesting. And to compliment what Robert said about the Nova's ashram, uh, I, I found it the most beautiful place I've ever been. Um, I've been to a lot of beautiful places and I've uh, been to a lot of historical places and all that, but. It's just very, very beautiful. And the ethic of selfless service and commitment is really still there. So I, I would reinforce what Robert said. And, and it is true, they were tending the cows because I think uh, the prime minister was coming the next day to celebrate some holiday, Indian Independence Day. So they were getting the cow, they were massaging the cows, getting the cows ready. And then this one cow is really like a bull, but he kind of turned away from the massage. And then he saw all of us at the fence because we were watching them. And he just kind of zeroed in. And this cow, this bull was just coming slowly, but just coming, totally concentrated. <laughs> and when he got to the fence, that's where he must have known my wife from previous life or something, but, uh, or felt her good vibes or that heart. But so, um, anyway, it's, um, uh, you know, in India, there are a lot of things like that that kind of happen. I mean, I'm sure in Hawaii it does too. And we don't hear about it because why do you want to put it in the newspaper? You know? But these kinds of real things, this is real, this is real, real reality. So, and I'd really like to compliment Sarah. As you suspect, having been around there, I've heard people talk about Vinoba Bhavi, but yours was the most core and central speaking to the heart. I mean, you really got to the essence of it, and I've never heard that before. So thank you so much for your presentation. It was wonderful. It, was, it did seem that way, what you were mentioning, that it could have been this Mr. Reddy, that's a great way to put it, that it was really his it came into his head, but it really it didn't make much of a difference in, yeah. that, in the fact that this was one heart really. 
moving, but Vinoba's presence just sparked that that heart. Yeah. And then Vinoba, it, in one of the readings, it was saying Vinoba was shocked. So he was just, wow, this could happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like a, a complete synergistic rather than this individual this and then that person says that. And Yes. Yeah. Makes me think about <clears throat> comparing to culture in India, where I think maybe it was uh, maybe not second nature, but within the culture, it was more natural for them to give. I'm just thinking in contrast to the couple of generations that were just moving out of, where there was a very uh, meistic kind of selfish. Um, the uh, the famous quote about about greed. Uh, that I think we're moving away from in our culture, one would hope. And you see the rise of like a Burning Man culture, which is really the whole culture of Burning Man is it's a gift economy. Everything is given. And uh, they show uh, quite clearly uh, how it is that people are naturally giving. And uh, if, in a couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about um, philosopher named Mengzi, uh, who was a Confucian and, and has some very good arguments that our very nature is benevolent and compassionate in giving. And we, it, we're by nature, if, if those are nurtured within us, it's very natural for us to grow into virtuous people, kind and loving. Uh, and I think our cultural as a basis is starting to show up uh, I'm kind of a fan of what Elon Musk has done with his great fortune. You know, he's changing the world, you know, one piece at a time, but looking at <clears throat> the, the industry of automobiles and, and fuel and, and stepping forward and investing in a cleaner alternative. I think this might be a modern day version of this. So it isn't so much about the action of giving land or giving wealth, but also just changing the culture through through one's uh, through one's acts. Yes, I think that really was uh, a big question that that came out of the talk for me. Is how do we make that shift culturally to be more of that giving culture? And having an exemplar, um, like you mentioned, Elon Musk, um, seems to, to help. And there, it's probably small, 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 but eventually it, um, it becomes more evident on the surface. But that is a question. How do we tip the scales? I also think of on that Vinoba's walking with non-attachment and that we can live nurturing our, our hearts in a sense and live really with that heart of giving of unity alive and allow what this um, current world story needs to be maybe or whatever karma is playing out depending on the belief that it is playing out because it needs to in order for whatever the universal reasons may be. Along with uh, Renee's comment, uh, we were just thinking that, um, and also David's very, very apt comment, that uh, you can imagine um, a society, perhaps a culture uh, of, of the future where it will just be taken for granted. It will be one of the premises of you know, social organization, government, um, and um, the ethos of communities to make sure that everyone's taken care of, that, you know, <clears throat> that no one's going hungry, <laughs> no one's without shelter, um, everyone has is has an opportunity for education and um, and healthcare. That those are just basics that that 
the society is should be taken care of. That, 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 that's all of our responsibilities. And you can imagine perhaps that this, a, a, an entire civilization, not just small communities and little isolated um, groups, but it being the, the you know, fundamental ethos and motivation of a culture. And we're thinking about um, the Sikhs, which probably many of you know about, their, their uh, famous, uh, the Golden Temple in Amritsar, it's northern India, where they feed 100,000 people a day. <laughs> and the temple, they, that's, there's people who dedicate their lives to making food that can then be distributed through the temple. And, and farmers who donate food, um, industrialists who donate money so food can be purchased, but they, that's part of their dharma uh, of the Sikhs is that they're supposed to make sure that the community is fed. So the temple is open 24 seven, anyone who wants to can come in and they can, they, they feed them food <laughs> and really good food, that's <laughs> all. And I know there's, uh, there's Sikh temples in, uh, there's one in Riverside even, which uh, during the pandemic, they're feeding people uh, out of their cars, you can say drive up, free food, drive up. And um, there's one in England as well, I know. So anyway, I think it's very, it's very possible that, you know, it, it, at some incarnation, not too distantly, we might find ourselves in a society like that, hopefully. I think this uh, global pandemic uh, has uh, highlighted a number of areas um, in particular, this idea of giving, uh, even the government uh, getting uh, on board with this uh, little credit card they send out to people on uh, unemployment. It's charged up with $500 that you can spend at any local restaurant. So it's a way of uh, taking from the main pot and giving to those uh, who actually need it. I, I, I think this is, a, <laughs> this is a, little, a little gem, this little COVID. Uh, Business. Sharon? I was thinking of the story. I met this man, and he was, I think, from San Francisco, and he was, I met him in Kailua, and he was telling me, I guess his father was very rich and wealthy and like a multimillionaire or something like that. Um, but this man had gone to Guatemala to work there with the poor. And he was in this hut where this family, like they had dirt floor. And the family was really thankful for his help and everything that they gave him a loaf of bread. And so he was telling me about how his father, the multimillionaire father, left him off of the, his will. And um, the father, you know, always looked at him because he traveled or did other things or went to other countries. And this is really funny because what the Guatemalan family gave you with their loaf of bread was probably worth more than your father would have given you in his will in millions of dollars because that was their food and that was all they had. And that's what they shared was just the slope of it. And it was worth more than the millions of dollars that your father would have you know, given to you. And in a way your father did your service because he saw that you are a much happier person than he was. And he was, uh, the father was unhappy, his brother, I think other people in his family live really well and did all, you know, were, but they had unhappy lives. But he himself was doing what he wanted to. He traveled to these places. He didn't live. When I saw him, he was wearing like clothes. That, yeah, I mean, you know, he walked into the, and I, I didn't know who he was, but then he was sharing the story with me. So sometimes even a loaf of bread from someone is worth millions of dollars compared to someone else who has a lot. So it doesn't matter what you share or what is given to you. Each person around us might share something that might seem insignificant or very small, but is actually worth a lot more than we realize. That's a beautiful story. Thank you so much, Sharon. I wanted to uh, let Cliff um, give us a vote of thanks to Sarah for the wonderful job she did today. 
Sarah, I uh, just thinking of that. Uh, Krishna says that the first of the godlike qualities is fearlessness. And with you taking on this challenge of talking about Banova Bhavi, who didn't know anything about volunteering to do it without even knowing who the fellow was, <laughs> I think is definitely an act of fearlessness. But the fact that you took it on and, and looked at Banova uh, in an original and very fresh way, as, as Maurice was saying, it, it it was just so pure and genuine, the story of Vanova. It just it, it brought I, I felt kind of tingly about it. It just felt like he was his presence was here in this um, in this conversation. And and uh, so I really want to thank you for bringing him to life again for all of us and and sharing uh, your your study in him and and uh, and your resonation, you, you resonated with, I think, all the core values that that he represents that are so in need right now. But maybe at the pandemic is putting us back on our heels and helping us kind of realign with those important core values of giving and humility and empathy and 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 dharma in terms of the the, the, the good of the whole. So it was a very very wonderful. Uh, conversation you led and I just want to thank you on behalf of everybody. So. Thank you and thank you for the books Cliff. <laughs> I really felt as as I got to know as when Renee asked me and then I read about him a little bit I thought wow what an amazing guy and as I was reading these books I felt like I was getting to know him and sitting with him and talking with him so really wonderful to it came through it felt like he was sitting right next to you there. <laughs> Thank you all so, so very much for your participation today. Thank you, Renee. Thank you, Sarah, so much. Just amazing. Wonderful job, Sarah. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for your contributions as well. Thank you, Hello. Sarah. Happy Halloween. Hello, Sarah. Nice Hello, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.